Hi, my name is Ken Rogers, and this is Think Tech Hawaii. And uh, this is a series called uh, View from the North or View from Canada uh, about items that of interest to Americans. Um, <clears throat> this uh, episode today is on uh, military law, uh, comparing uh, the U.S. with Canada and other countries. Hi, I have uh, two very esteemed guests today. Uh, firstly, uh, I have uh, Rory uh, Fowler. Rory has a unique education. It's very unusual that somebody has uh, two college degrees in law, and particularly from two different countries. Um, Rory has a, a normal Bachelor of Law degree uh, from an esteemed Canadian university and, and a master's degree from the prestigious University College in London, England. Uh, he has um, uh, 28 years of experience in the Canadian military or Canadian forces as they call him up here. Uh, he at first was an officer in the infantry, which sounds unusual for a lawyer, uh, but uh, uh, then, uh, for most of his career, he was a legal officer uh, in the office of what they call the Judge Advocate General in Canada. Um, <clears throat> since 19, uh, 2017, uh, he's been in private legal practice with his own firm in uh, Kingston, Ontario. And uh, he's a, a very frequent and coveted speaker on uh, military law in Canada. Uh, my other esteemed guest, since we have a very uh, powerful Canadian, I figured we had to have match it with a powerful American. Uh, we have uh, uh, Jean Fidel, uh, who is a graduate of Harvard Law School and um, and has taught military justice in, in three of the top uh, law schools in the United States, uh, Yale, Harvard, and New York University. Uh, he's the author of of a, uh, a book called Military Justice, a very short introduction. Uh, if you're interested, that's available on Amazon or in your local bookstore. Uh, he also was a co-founder and is currently a director of the uh, National Institute of Military Justice. That's, a, as Americans call them, an NGO or a, a nonprofit, non-government organization. A uh, very prestigious one. Uh, he's also the editor of the blog called uh, Global Military Justice Reform. Now, with that introduction, uh, I expect, uh, you know, brilliant remarks from the two of you. Uh -oh. uh, since my knowledge of uh, military law is not great. So why don't we start with just uh, what what's the basis of military justice system? I mean, why do we have separate law why why doesn't the rest of the normal law work what what's the whole point of a military justice system après vous après vous rory <laughs> Thank, <laughs> thanks gene i was i was actually going to say after you but you you managed to beat me to the punch um well, well ken we can we can talk about and and gene and i probably definitely will talk about the constitutional and legislative basis for military law but let's let's talk conceptually uh, normatively, why do we have a separate system of military justice? And and both the United States and Canada and many of our allied countries, uh, particularly uh, the common law countries, um, have a separate system of military justice that functions not just during wartime, not just during operations, but even during peacetime and during uh, domestic training. And so conceptually, uh, at least in Canada, and and I'm confident in saying that it's it's pretty much a similar justification in the states. Conceptually, the justification uh, for having a separate system of military justice is that that parallels and often in Canada incorporates elements of our criminal law is because of the need to maintain the discipline, efficiency, and morale of our armed forces. Um, and, and that's been tested at various stages uh, in, in history in Canada before the Supreme Court of Canada. Most notably after the introduction in the Charter, there was a 1993 case of, of the Queen versus Genero, and much more recently, 
in 2019, the Queen versus Stillman. And in fact, in Stillman, there were multiple members of the Canadian forces who were involved in that appeal. But what the Supreme Court of Canada has upheld is that the maintenance of that discipline, efficiency and morale of the Canadian forces is not something that is simply enforced during operations or during wartime, that it is something that is manifest and something that needs to be maintained at all times. And therefore, having a separate separate system, albeit one that is essentially consistent with our Charter of Rights and Freedoms, much like our criminal justice system, is justified at law uh, because of the need to maintain an effective fighting force. And and I'll, I'll turn over to Gene for him to talk about the American experience. Right. Well, of course, uh, our, our experience, uh, our roots are very much the same as the roots of the Canadian system. Uh, both systems uh, traced to the Articles of War that were signed by uh, the last, uh, our last king, George III, uh, a couple of years before the revolution. Um, and, and indeed, uh, the specter of uh, his late majesty continues to, uh, to uh, tread the boards. Uh, uh, aspects of the system that he uh, uh, presided over uh, continue with us uh, in both systems. And, and really the history of the last, or the period since World War II in both countries uh, has been a period of, uh, on the one hand, dramatic reform, and on the other hand, uh, a, a retention of some of the central elements of uh, George the Third system. Uh, I'm not making fun of George the uh, Third. Actually, I think history uh, is increasingly kind to him. Um, but but the that. facts are the facts, and his uh, his. Um, uh, 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 government um, uh, has left us a left us a, a lasting legacy, a legacy that extends to a continually large part of the world. And I'm thinking of India, Pakistan, South Africa, uh, Nigeria. Uh, uh, you know, country after country uh, in or formerly in the Commonwealth of Nations. And uh, it's it's a tremendous legacy. It's really interesting as a, kind of the history of ideas and the history of law and legal institutions. Um, but let, let's get into some of the uh, some of the uh, issues. Um, well, and, 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 and I, I want to make one more point, one more point. And then uh, and Rory, I'd be interested in your reaction to this in English history. And I've had occasion uh, in connection with a case that I'm currently working on to really drill down into the uh, English history in the 18th century, English military legal history. And uh, it's clear that Parliament was very jealous uh, about guarding the civil liberties of the subject. Uh, they, they kept uh, the military and the military justice system on a very short leash. Uh, it's, it's a fascinating tale. And you don't think of the military legal uh, uh, context as, um, you know, a place where you would look for the manifestation of fundamental democratic values, but actually they're there. And uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, Parliament uh, was very hostile in the 18th century to a standing army. And as a result, uh, uh, there was something called the Mutiny Act, that had to be reenacted by Parliament every single year. Uh, so this was a really, really short leash. Uh, I, I think I think we've gotten away from that. We probably because we trust our armed forces now more than they may have done in the in the uh, uh, 18th century. Uh, but uh, it's it's just telling and how little we know really about that period. I don't know about Rory's probably up on this. And uh, Ken, I'm sure you're uh, very up on the 18th century as well. Uh, do you remember the 18th century, Ken? I'm not quite that old, <laughs> uh, but uh, perhaps to to uh, you know add a question and and ro and throw it to uh, Rory is really what is the the role of the normal courts vis-a-vis -vis the uh, military justice system and 
and and how independent is the military justice you know from a, a normal court uh, well can th- th- that's a huge question because of all that's implied so I'll try and break it down and and what I'll talk about I'll talk about three separate things and I'll talk about the independence of our of our military courts and and I think this is really the nub of what Gene and I are going to talk about this evening. And so I'm going to leave that to the end, the independence issue. Um, and, and there's an ironic little twist in that uh, some leading case law in Canada that emerged just as the Charter uh, of Rights and Freedoms was enacted that dealt with the independence of courts generally, actually borrowed from a pre-charter case of military law and the independence of courts martial. And we've, we've now come full circle um, now that uh, a recent, the Supreme Court of Canada recently accepted uh, or granted leave for appeal in a series of cases that deals with the independence of military judges. So we, we've come full circle in the space of about 45 years. Um, but but I'll, I'm going to leave the independence for the end because that's probably going to be our stepping off point for further discussion. The other thing I'm going to talk about is what do we mean by military justice? And there's a narrow definition and a broad definition. And then we can talk about the role of ordinary civil courts in in resolving questions of military justice. So in Canada, last year, Bill C-77 finally came into force, or significant elements of it came into force. Bill C-77, which was an act to amend the the National Defense Act that introduced the Victims uh, Bill of Rights to the Canadian military justice system, was actually enacted in 2019. But significant portions of it only came into force on the 20th of June, 2022. It took three years uh, for the governor and council to enact the regulations that would bring it into force. And and one of the things that that did is it introduced an express definition of military justice uh, for the National Defense Act. And military justice essentially is equivalent to the Code of Service Discipline. Now, that's the narrow definition. That's the disciplinary regime that governs the Canadian forces. But one could talk about military justice in a much more broad sense, because when we look at the maintenance of discipline, efficiency, and morale in the Canadian forces, the code of service discipline is but one tool that is used for that. It's it's a heavy tool. It's a big tool. Uh, It's a big hammer that can be used to discipline members of the Canadian forces. But it's not the only one that's used. And increasingly, I would suggest it's not even the most frequently used. Increasingly, over the past seven years, I have seen an increase in the use of what can be characterized as administrative measures. So non-disciplinary measures that are used to maintain the discipline, efficiency, and morale of the Canadian forces. And when a member of the armed forces feels aggrieved by any such administrative measures, their first course of action would be to bring a grievance within the statutory process that's set out in the National Defense Act. But after that, they have recourse to the ordinary civil court, specifically the Federal Court of Canada. And so the civil courts still have a role to play in supervising the executive when they're exercising those administrative decision-making powers. We've also seen where the civil courts continue to have a role to play based upon recent direction, when I say recent, it was about a year and a half ago, that the Minister of National Defense issued to the Director of Military Prosecutions to the Canadian Forces Provo Marshal, that allegations of sexual assault and other allegations of criminal misconduct of a sexual nature will be investigated by civil police and will be prosecuted before the civil courts. Because our civil courts have parallel and concurrent jurisdiction in matters of criminal law. So if a member of the Canadian Forces commits an assault, a criminal code assault under Section 266, they could potentially be prosecuted at court martial, but they could also be prosecuted before a civil court, either a provincial court or a superior court of justice. So there is concurrent parallel jurisdiction. Now, one could argue that the Minister of National Defense doesn't have the power to issue direction directly to uh, the Director of Military Prosecutions or the Canadian Forces Provo Marshal. In fact, I've overtly said that because she doesn't. But the point to take away from that is that the civil courts continue to have jurisdiction. And we are seeing some, but not all, allegations of uh, sexualized criminal misconduct 
allegedly committed by members of the Canadian forces being prosecuted before civil courts. Some are still being prosecuted before courts martial. So now you've got a selective justice system. But the civil courts, just because we've got a military justice system, doesn't mean the civil courts cease to function vis-a-vis -vis members of the armed forces. And that brings you, us to independence. You, oh, but be, be, before you get to independence, yeah. like, let me, uh, for the benefit of uh, viewers who may not be familiar either because they're not Americans or if they are Americans, they've never thought much about the military justices. And let me just uh, give the counterpoint <clears throat> for the American system. It, uh, as Rory implied, uh, the military, uh, to be an effective fighting force, has to be disciplined. And uh, the U.S. armed forces are pervasively regulated. This is a pervasively regulated line of work where everybody's there are rules and regs covering everything. Everybody's evaluated regularly. It's an up or out system, basically. And um, <clears throat> as a result, <clears throat> it's a system that has a, a complex web of uh, sanctions, only some of which are what we classically think of as military justice, namely courts martial. Uh, it, but that's like if I we uh, I think we just had the anniversary of the sinking of the Titanic, didn't we? That's just the tip of the iceberg. Forgive the expression, <laughs> because uh, the, what has happened, and I think Rory suggested this. What has happened is this less and less reliance on the classical court martial that we all know from the Kane mutiny and all of that stuff, but a few good men, uh, and more and more reliance on other kinds of sanctions, whether it's summary trials, as they're known in Canada, or non-judicial punishment, and as they're known in the United States. And uh, interestingly, the current numbers even though the United States has a, an enormous military legal establishment, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of lawyers, um, we we had something like I think twelve or thirteen hundred general and special courts martial last year, as opposed to something like ninety five thousand non judicial punishments for various kinds of relatively minor uh, offenses. So you have that. You have that set of uh, sanctions, and then you have a million other kinds of sanctions. If you act up, we're going to throw you out. If you act up, we're going to demote you. If you act up, we're not going to send you to medical school. If you act up, we're not going to let you fly the airplane, and so on and so forth. Uh, now, uh, on the question of the interaction, Ken, between the military uh, legal structure and the civilian courts, just a word on that very briefly. Uh, in both countries, uh, some military cases, and here I'm thinking of the criminal cases, the courts martial, uh, uh, are eligible to be taken to the Supreme Court of the country. And occasionally, as Rory mentioned, occasionally uh, the Supreme Court of Canada and less occasionally the Supreme Court of the United States uh, do find themselves uh, dealing with questions of military law, although they they tend not to get into sort of technical, arcane questions of military law. They tend to take the cases that have some generic constitutional or charter uh, issues. The other thing is, in some circumstances, uh, a person can contest a court martial collaterally. And by that, I mean, if you're in confinement, and the military has confinement facilities, prisons. Uh, the writ of habeas corpus is available, at least in the United States. Rory can correct me if I'm wrong, but I imagine it's at least in theory possible in Canada. So you could you could have a military case wind up as a as a habeas corpus, just the way a state or a provincial prisoner uh, might wind up challenging a criminal conviction. Uh, in the in the civilian courts. Let me stop there because I know Rory's dying appro appropriately to talk about judicial independence, which is one of the major issues both systems are facing. So, so judicial independence is uh, something that is tested frequently, and what I'm going to suggest is uh, we can look even beyond the United States and Canada. Uh, 
It is something that has been recently tested in the United Kingdom. It is something that has been recently tested in Australia. It is something that has been tested recently in Canada and is about to be tested again before the Supreme Court of Canada uh, with with uh, the appeal of the Queen and Edwards and others. Um, and it, it, it's it's a matter that's been tested in the United States. What I think is you interesting? Mean the, King, the King and Edwards. Uh, true. It was well, the Queen and Edwards when it was when it was tried at, at court martial and before the court martial appeal court. It is now the King and Edwards. Right. Although I'll, I'll be quiet. I'll be quiet now. <laughs> the 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 um the style the style is still yet to be determined because there's actually four separate streams of cases that have been collapsed together. And in fact, when they granted leave, there was just a, a big long list of cases uh, that received uh, leave to appeal. And it made it look like the Supreme Court of Canada had granted leave to a half a dozen cases and it was all the same thing. They're all going to be grouped together. Um, but but Gene is right. Now it's the the, the the King and Edwards and others. The uh, The challenge that we have from a comparative perspective is that each country has dealt with these matters in slightly different ways and has slightly different laws, constitutional laws dealing with them, even though we all come from a common antecedent. And as, as, as Gene has mentioned, all of these nations, notwithstanding American uh, exceptionalism, uh, all of these countries, Australia, Canada, the United Kingdom, United States, and New Zealand, all have common law backgrounds. We all have manifested our armed forces in relatively similar fashion. And we all have relatively similar military justice systems. There have been discrete differences. And I mention these countries because we're one to compare us to the continental systems, like in Germany, like in France. You would see marked differences. And so really, and, and this is a very rough approximation, but generally speaking, the common law countries, so the the uh, Kenzuckus countries to, to include uh, the United States. So those five common law countries uh, who often work cooperatively uh, all still have very robust military justice systems that function in parallel to the ordinary civil courts and often overlap. And where there is a broad application of military justice, even in peacetime, this can be contrasted. And again, it's a very rough approximation to the continental systems which increasingly apply their military law only during times of war or only during operations and do not generally apply it domestically and during peacetime. Now, that's an extremely broad generalization, but France is a good example. France does not apply their disciplinary system within the borders of France during peacetime. They use their ordinary civil courts for that. Whereas in Canada, uh, we still apply courts martial across the board, as in the United States, as in Australia. And what we've seen in these common law countries is slightly different evolution of the independence of their judiciary. And, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be daring. I'm going to leave out New Zealand for the time being. Uh, but I'm going to suggest that there is a spectrum of independence with respect to the judiciary. And at the most independent end of the spectrum, I would suggest is the United Kingdom, because of recent reforms where they have made all of their military judges civilians who serve under their judge advocate general, who is actually a judge. He's the head of their judiciary. He's distinct from the judge advocate general in the United States and in Canada, who's the head of the legal services for the armed forces or for a particular service. Um, but the UK judge advocate general is the head of their military judiciary and their judiciary are all civilians. I would then suggest that the next in line for independence would probably be Canada, closely followed by Australia, and at the not at the other end of the spectrum, but perhaps the least independent judiciary are the American military judges, um, in large part because the, a, a big distinguishing feature between American military judges and Canadian military judges, they're serving officers. Our military judges are former legal officers. American military judges are legal officers who are now serving as military judges. The difference is once our legal officers are appointed as military judges, they stay military judges until they hit compulsory retirement age or choose to retire. American military judges are like what our military judges were conceptualized back in 1998 
with Bill C-25, because when we introduced Bill C-25, the an anticipated role would be military judges would be appointed for a five-year term, and they could be renewed or they could return to being legal officers. Now, why anyone would return to being a legal officer when a military judge gets paid about $80,000 a year more and has a broad amount of independence and status, I'm, I'm not sure why anyone would conceptualize that somebody might return to being no, a legal note, officer. Note, by the way, if I could just... To add a footnote, note that a judge who uh, has a relatively short term of office, five years is relatively short for a judge, and is eligible for reappointment, is a judge who is likely to be looking over her shoulder. Oh, not, a good not just likely to be, very likely to be looking over <laughs> his or her shoulder. I mean, that was the main point. So. <laughs> The, the independence of the military judges was challenged before the court martial appeal court of Canada in 2011 in a case called the Queen the Queen and LeBlanc, because it was still a queen then, Gene, in, in the Queen and LeBlanc. And, and the court ruled that, no, the, the, the uh, five-year appointment process uh, doesn't carry with it the, the security of tenure that is required for independence. We have to remember across common law jurisdictions and even in mixed jurisdictions, the the three requirements of independence of judges is security of tenure, security of remuneration, and institutional independence. And without those three things, you can still be independent. And as I've, I've often opined, independence is not a binary state, right? Independence is a sliding scale. And one of the most independent actors within any government setup will be judges because of those three criteria, the the institutional independence, the security of tenure, and the security of remuneration. You can still have people operating with a degree of independence. For example, the director of military prosecutions has a degree of independence. Does he have security of tenure? To an extent, because he's appointed to a four-year term, can be renewed, can only be removed from office through a mechanism under the National Defense Act. Does he have security of remuneration? Not really. He's paid the same thing as any other colonel or any other legal officer colonel. Does he have institutional independence? Again, a degree of institutional independence, but not much. And so our judges come reasonably close to being as independent as uh, a civilian judge, certainly more so than they did in 2010. But there's still some underlying concerns because they are still subject as officers of the Canadian forces. They are subject to the code of service discipline. And we ran into a circumstance like that when the director of military prosecutions attempted and failed to prosecute the chief military judge. And there was a bit of a hue and cry over that. I would suggest, and here's the thing, I would suggest that as of the 20th of June, 2022, our military judges are less independent than they were before that date. And the reason for that is, under the old system that we used to have, and Gene mentioned we have summary trials, we no longer have summary trials in Canada, we have summary hearings that are much more similar to the non-judicial punishment of the United States. Whereas in our summary trial system, you could elect trial by court martial for many of the offenses, now they are completely separate processes. Summary hearings deal with service infractions, Courts martial deal with offenses. If you're charged with a service infraction, there is no election for court martial. Under the old system, our military judges were exempt from summary trials. They could not be tried by summary trial. They are not exempt from service infractions. <laughs> so now we have a situation where not only could they be charged and tried under the Code of Service Discipline when other select officers cannot, but conceptually, the, a, a military judge could be charged with a service infraction and tried by a superior commander like the deputy vice chief of defense staff. And among the penalties that are available to the deputy vice chief of defense staff, if, she, if he or she were to try a military judge, would be things like a deprivation of pay, which everyone else would call a fine, but for some reason we can't call it a fine. But it would also include minor punishments, which can include confinement to barracks. So you could conceivably have a military judge tried by a layperson and sentenced to confinement to barracks for up to two weeks 
which is not unlike house arrest, which is a deprivation of liberty. And I'm really waiting to see how director of military prosecutions will explain that that doesn't undermine the independence of a military judge and doesn't infringe section seven of the charter, which guarantees all Canadians uh, to be free from deprivation of life, liberty, or security of the person, except in accordance with principles of fundamental justice. Rory, let me take a second and just uh, uh, recount the the history that we've gone through. It's a somewhat different history. Uh, traditionally, and this uh, uh, in George the Third's time, there were no military judges. <laughs> military judges are a, a relatively recent innovation, uh, but. Uh, when they were first created, uh, and uh, let's say that was 1968 in the United States, we had something sort of like a judge before then, starting in around 1920. Uh, but when they were first created in 1968, they were at will judges. They had no term of office, whatever. They could be fired tomorrow or transferred to Guam. No offense to Guamanians, but, but you know, transferred someplace unattractive, let's say. Um, then uh, the, uh, there was a, a good deal of litigation. I was involved in, in some of that, uh, challenging the lack of any term of office at all. I mean, if you really want to get down to the heart of the matter, it's the term of office. The pay is secondary and the institutional independence that's nice, but a term of office is is the the heart of of the uh, judicial independence in my in my judgment. Uh, there was litigation that it was a deprivation of due process of law under the Fifth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution to be tried in a criminal case which could impose the death penalty or prolong you know life in prison by a judge who had no protection at all. Uh, and the Supreme Court of the United States said, no problem. It, 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 we, it, we, you don't worry about that, because in 1787, when our Constitution was uh, developed and at the convention in Philadelphia, there were no military judges. So what's what's the problem? Anyway, eventually, eventually, the U.S. Army decided, you know, maybe there's something to this. And they passed a regulation giving judges a term of office. It, it had all kinds of outs, you know, if it was the convenience of the service that we needed you doing something else to be the assistant Coca-Cola machine officer, that was okay. But um, but it was it was a mere regulation. And worse yet, not all the services went along with that. That was only the Army. Then the Coast Guard went along. That's a tiny little service. Um, and the uh, Navy, Marine Corps, and Air Force refused to go along. And that lasted for several years. And then finally, 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 Congress said, wait, wait a minute, we're going to impose a requirement. Then they directed the president to uh, uh, issue a regulation in the, what we call the manual for courts martial that would create a term of office. So what's the term of office? Three years. And I'm here to tell you, three years is too short to give meaningful and independence to a judge. And worse worse yet, it's renewable. So you really have a problem. Uh, I'll, I'll just give you my personal take on this. I've come to conclude that the norm ought to be the period of uh, the, the term of office that's provided to relatively low level federal judges in the United States, what we call magistrate judges. And by statute, Congress has long given those judges an eight-year term of office, which strikes me as reasonable and the kind of thing that would uh, cause the the office holder to be, you know, pretty independent, which is all you can ask. I mean, you, you could you could even put aside independence. I would suggest three years is too short a term to even learn how to do your job effectively. Oh, that, right? that this I mean, is true. Yeah, uh, forget independence, and 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 if we're looking at 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 at, uh, at postings, uh, I'll take Guam. Just just so you know, Gene, I'll I'll take Guam if 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 that's up in the offerings. <laughs> but I, I mean that that's part of the challenge. I'm, I'm going to get a lot of hate mail for this, by the way. <laughs> uh, it's, especially since this is being broadcast in Hawaii. Uh, I know the <laughs> the the um when we're talking about judges and and one of the challenges we've got. And I see, and, and, and I wrote about this. So Gene and I both contributed 
uh, to a book called Marching to Justice, which was edited by a couple of colleagues of ours, an American colleague, Frank uh, uh, Rosenblatt, and and uh, Navdeep Singh, an Indian colleague of ours. It's, it, it's a wonderful book that covers justice systems from around the world, and both Gene and I contributed. And, and the contribution that I made talked a little bit about how in Canada, we've never really struggled adequately. Uh, forget I answered the question. We've never really struggled until now, because I anticipate the, the Supreme Court of Canada will struggle with this in the King and Edwards. Um, but we've never really struggled with what exactly are military judges. And it's a question that has been answered in the United States, and it has been answered in Australia in relatively similar fashion, frankly, in both of those countries. And the reason I mention these three countries is we have a lot in common constitutionally. All three countries are federal regimes with both national and subnational governments. We have a constitution that divides the powers between the national and subnational level. Uh, the difference actually between the three countries, Canada in that regard is the outlier, uh, because in the United States, residual powers rest with the states. In Australia, residual powers rest with the states. In Canada, residual powers do not rest with the provinces, they rest with the federal government. Our criminal law in Canada is in, is enforced, it's prosecuted provincially, but it's enacted federally, whereas in Australia and the United States, criminal law or penal law is enacted in, in the states. So there are distinctions. In the United States and Australia, uh, their apex courts have very clearly ruled that courts martial and the military judges presiding over them are not what I would characterize as ordinary courts or ordinary judges. They are not part of the judicial branch of government. So in the United States, they are very clearly, and Gene can correct me if I'm wrong, I am not an American constitutional scholar, even though proximity has forced me to you're, learn you're a little bit about the American TV, Constitution. Worry. You're playing one on TV. <laughs> I am right now. So uh, the, the courts martial and military judges are what could be characterized as Article I judges. They are not Article Three judges, which is the separate judiciary. In the same vein, in Australia, uh, military judges are not what they call Chapter Three judges. They are not part of the judicial branch. That question has been answered relatively definitively in Australia and the United States. It has not been answered in Canada. It hasn't even been asked. They've danced around it. So in Genru, they danced around that question. In Stillman, they danced around that question. And I would suggest that in Edwards, which will be heard sometime in the next 12 to 18, 18 months, whether it's heard by seven judges, eight judges, or nine judges is yet to be determined. Um, but in, in Edwards, the court is going to be forced to address whether or not military judges actually belong to the judicial branch or are part of the executive. And Murray, that makes all the you, difference in the world. I want to ask you a question. Sure. Um, let, I want to shift the focus here for a minute to Parliament. And um, we'll get to Congress as well. But um, what what's the deal in, uh, you know, everybody complains about their legislature. <laughs> that's, you know, in every in every democratic country, that's the thing about having a democracy. You get to complain about the You legislature. get to complain and nobody right, shoots right, you. Right, right, right. And, uh, right. and nobody arrests you. Uh, so- what what's the role of parliament? How does parliament view its role with respect to the administration of military justice? And I have a specific question in mind. Does parliament ever try to uh, 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 influence the administration administration of justice in specific military cases? So, so I'll break that down into two questions because you've actually asked me two questions. So what's the role of parliament and what's the role that parliament sees for itself? And I would suggest those are two <laughs> markedly different questions. Or at the very it least, wasn't a trick question, but markedly you a trick answers, answer. <laughs> right? but, so, but Gene, that, that's Gene probably because you don't know the obstinance of our prime minister. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm learning. I, I, I won't get into the politics of it, but what I will say is this. In any Westminster styled parliamentary democracy, which excludes you splitters in the United States, right? You, <laughs> you decided you didn't want a king. That's too bad. You don't get one. 
Um, so in, in, in Westminster style parliamentary democracies, parliament is supreme. Which a lot of people don't understand because they think, well, we've got the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, we've got the Constitution. But at the end of the day, there is an amending formula. The Constitution can be changed. It would be changed by Parliament. Parliament is supreme. It is Parliament that legislates. It is the executive branch that governs, that administers. And unlike in the United States and unlike in republics, our executive is drawn from Parliament in part. So our executive is His Majesty the King in concert with His Majesty's uh, Privy Councillors, the Cabinet, the Executive, the Governor and Council. And that's where you get Governor and Council from. It's the Sovereign in Council with His Majesty's Privy Councillors. So Parliament being supreme holds the Executive accountable. Conceptually, in theory, in a Westminster-style parliamentary democracy, Parliament decides whether or not the government carries on because the government must command the confidence of Parliament. Now, if you're elected with a majority government, odds are you're going to command the confidence of Parliament. In fact, even if you're elected to a minority government and one of the opposition parties doesn't have much of a spine you're probably going to command the confidence of the House. And granted, I am getting a little bit political there. Um, <laughs> but that distinguishes us from the United States because of the, the clear separation between the executive and, and, and the legislature. Um, th there are a number of other distinctions, but that's a huge distinction because at the end of the day, the command of the armed forces of Canada, by virtue of our Constitution, the Constitution Act 1867, Section 15 vests command of the armed forces of Canada in the sovereign. So it's the crown that exercises, not really the crown, uh, not really the governor and council, but the crown itself has vested command in the armed forces. Now that's generally exercised by the Minister of National Defence, because under the National Defence Act, by virtue of Section 4, the minister has direction and authority over all aspects of national defense. And again, by virtue of our Constitution Act 1867, Section 91 sub 7 grants Parliament the authority to legislate for the militia, the military, and the naval forces, and for defense, right? And so our constitutional construct vests the authority of command in the sovereign, but the legislative authority within Parliament and then Parliament has legislated to grant the Minister of National Defense the authority to govern the Canadian forces. But, but here, let me let me give you let, let me give you a uh, a for instance. Okay, that's very much on my mind, and I think Americans uh, uh, tomorrow morning they're going to pick up the paper or go online and they're going to read about this. We it's not a military justice matter, but it is a matter uh, that has to do with the role of Congress uh, as. Everybody knows uh, former President Trump is uh, facing criminal proceedings, uh, particularly in Manhattan, New York County, New York. And the district attorney there, Alvin Bragg, uh, has been subjected to pressure by uh, Republicans in the House of Representatives, uh, suggesting that he shouldn't be investigating or uh, seeking an indictment from a grand jury in New York. Uh, of former President Trump. Is that is anything like that conceivable in Canada? Not really in that regard, because the, the big concern there, and th there were other concerns raised about Trump when he was president, you know, because he's the commander in chief, right? And there were things that were being done by him. Um, and certainly General Milley was placed in a couple of awkward positions uh, that, that he eventually dealt with relatively well, quite frankly. Um, but our commander in chief is not the prime minister. And our commander in chief, as I say, is technically the sovereign, or in Canada's case, the representative of the sovereign, the governor general. So command of our armed forces is vested not in the head of our government, uh, the prime minister, it's vested in the head of state, the sovereign or the sovereign's representative, the governor general. And that's one of the things that draws a distinction, because our head of state performs a largely ceremonial function. Whereas but in the United have, States, you have MPs or members of the, the Senate of Canada 
who uh, pick up the phone or send letters to the minister saying you got to kill this case? Uh, there have been, I will suggest to you that there have been members of parliament and there have been senators who have attempted to influence what I'll say more broadly speaking is statutory decision-making, which includes code of service discipline, but not just statutory sure. decision-making in the administration of the affairs of the Canadian forces. It doesn't go very far. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't go very far because at the end of the day, the, 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 um, Chief of the Defense Staff, by virtue of Section 18 of the National Defense Act, Defense Act, has control and administration of the Canadian Forces. The Chief of Defense Staff isn't going to worry about what an MP says. The Chief of the Defense Staff is going to worry about what the minister says, because the Chief of the Defense Staff is accountable to the minister. The minister is thereby accountable to Parliament. That's how Parliament holds um, decision makers accountable, is they hold the minister accountable in Parliament, right, in committee. Yeah. Uh, and so if an MP writes a letter trying to influence a case, it's just not going to go anywhere. Uh, it's not all that controversial in Canada, because if the director of military prosecution gets a letter from member of parliament for kicking horse pass, uh, the director of military prosecutions is just going to ignore it because um, there's nothing that can be done. Well, I, th- I think, Ken, we probably identified a few things that we'll have to put on the table for a further discussion, because as you can see, Rory and I'll keep going here until we, uh, you, you know, uh, we, we, until nightfall. <laughs> well, I, I, I was interested in trying to steer you into some uh, current issues. You know, in, in Canada, you've got uh, sexual misconduct. Same here. You know, and and yeah. key people, uh, you know, key uh, generals being kicked out of their job because of alle- allegations of sexual conduct, you know, nothing proven, you know. In fact, we've got a general, and Rory, correct me if I'm wrong, but a general making a lawsuit against the federal government for abusing him without due process. Yeah, I, I'm not going to comment too much, and that's that's Major General Danny Fortain. I, I'm not going to comment too much on his lawsuit. Um, there's a lot that could be said. I, I won't venture too much into that. What, what I will say is um, he's brought an action for damages that is broadly within the context of public law decision-making. That is not an easy thing to do. And, and I'll leave it there uh, because I, I, I know the lawyers who are representing him. They're very capable lawyers. Um and, and you had mentioned that some general officers have have been removed from their jobs because of mere allegations without prosecution. I mean, that cuts pretty close to home since one of them was a client of mine. Um, and, and that's not, you know, a secret or anything. But there have been a series of decisions made where individuals have suffered some fairly significant repercussions where there has not been any determination by anything remotely looking like a court. And in fact, Danny Forte is relatively u- unique among the general officers who stood accused because he actually had his day in court. And and that case, what I'll, I don't think I overstepped the bounds by saying that case imploded. Um, there were some significant defects in the evidence that was presented by, um, by the, the complainant. Uh, and indeed, it appears that the the version that the complainant testified to in court was markedly different than what she told the military police, uh, which is why that case imploded. I'll Um, just offer one comment. Uh, The the, the problem, the the situation of senior officers, uh, flag and general officers, is really, uh, there's an irony to it. Because on the one hand, if you ask the people in the barracks or in the pipe racks on the ships, uh, they'll tell you that there are different spanks for different ranks and the generals and admirals get away with murder and uh, whereas enlisted personnel or junior officers get hammered on the other hand as a practical matter if you're an admiral or a general in my opinion and speaking really about the situation in the united states where we have a lot of admirals and generals uh these are effectively effectively political appointments and if the management decides that they have lost trust and confidence in you, you're toast. You will simply be asked to retire. 
And there is a cudgel that the management has, which is they can do what's called the grade determination. And instead of retiring as a lieutenant general, you'll retire as a major general or, or less. All right. Well, that gives each of you a chance to say the last few words. How about uh, Rory, uh, do you shoot first since, since you're from the superior country? <laughs> well, what I'll say is what I'll say is this, Ken, uh, much as Churchill proclaimed uh, that the United Kingdom and the United States um, were two countries divided by a common language. Uh, one could say the same about the United States and Canada as two countries divided by uh, relatively common military justice systems. Um, there is much more that is similar about our, our countries uh, and our military justice systems, and I would suggest in large part because of similar cultures, uh, similar antecedents for our legislative regimes and for our military traditions, um, and the devil is in the details. Those nuanced distinctions that can help us learn about our own system by examining how those distinctions function in a parallel country. Uh, and, and that, for me, as a comparative analyst and, a, and a, as a comparative scholar, is, is where the gold mine is. That's where, that's where we, can, we can really examine um, how our own systems uh, can evolve for the better is is in examining those nuanced differences. And I can't improve on that, Eugene. No, I I can't improve on that. Rory's hit the nail on the thumb. All right. <clears throat> well, uh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, the uh, show uh, Think Tech and Think Tech uh, Hawaii uh, can be um, seen on on a variety of platforms. And uh, I've enjoyed very much having uh, two esteemed scholars uh, uh, to discuss a subject that I knew very little about, but uh, uh, certainly the two of you have done a masterful job. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.